Uh, hi folks, Steve the Amateur Historian, back again in the Alphabet District. And uh, I am headed towards the vicinity of Everett, Everett Street. Um, I know the Everett Hotel was along Everett, a little bit further back that way, almost a mile back that way. Um, that was where the George Gramati murder happened. So I've got multiple cases here connected to Everett Street. I'm just a little bit further west, and this is a this is a particularly tragic one, considering um, why this particular crime in question happened and how it probably should have been prevented. But anyway, I need to uh, cut this off before I get myself runned over. But anyway, it's a new episode of Historic Murders of Portland. So it's, it's mid-October 1924, uh, there's a woman named Maudine Nickerson who was going to, I don't know if it was the state hospital, but it was an asylum, where her brother Merle Muneer, I'll never forget that name, uh, was being kept. Uh, no real explanation why, but obviously he'd, he'd been there a while, he had some definite um, mental illness problems, mental enough to where he was locked away for a while. And by this point in 1924, both Merle Muneer's wife and Maudie Nickerson, his sister, had determined he, he wasn't fully recovered, but he was close enough to recovery that they felt he was good enough to be released, which is, it's an unfortunate thing that a lot of families do. Um, when they want, they want to have sympathy on members of their family that are struggling with, you know, any assortment of mental or emotional problems. They want to believe that, like, when they're, in, when they're put into, like, an asylum or something like that, they want to believe they're ready to go many times way too early. And that seems to be the scenario in this case. And Maudie Nickerson actually apparently was married to a prominent local musician, a guy named W.E. Nickerson. I've never heard of him, but if you know a uh, history of music, musicians in Portland, that name might ring a bell. Again, this is back in the 20s, so I'm guessing this guy would have been in his prime, teens, 20s, 30s, back then. And they lived in this neighborhood. So when they got uh, Muneer out of the asylum he was staying at. They brought him home so he could finish his recuperation. Um, in the confines of their home and the closeness of, you know, relatives. I know like Muneer's wife was also staying with them. So the idea was that he would recover in a place with people he knew that he was close to. And that brings us to October 22nd. 1924. Manir has been released from the asylum and home with family for approximately three days. And he's home alone with his sister, Modi Nickerson. So the house they lived in is this old red, this was the house was that was still here. This was the house they lived in. Again, I don't like lingering in front of private residents. When things happen in private residences, I like to kind of get my quick shot and leave. You know, I like to respect people's privacy, but you can see part of the house right over my shoulder, this, this red house right here. That house was built, according to historical documents, was built in 1895, so, you know, 1924, almost 30 years later, the house was still here, and in that house, 
um, Merle Minear. Merle. Merle Minear. I can't remember the guy's name. He's home alone with his sister, Maudie Nickerson. And I don't know exactly what's going on, but as the day is passing, Maudine goes down into the basement of this home. And Merle goes with her. And while they're down in the basement, I don't know if she's gathering stuff. I don't know exactly what's happening. But while they're down there together, Merle looks over at an, um, I think it was like a furnace. You know, I'm guessing lots of old places. You know, the furnaces are in the basement. I lived in a cottage, cottage type house built around the turn of the century. And pretty big sized furnace in the basement. And for whatever reason, Merle Meneer snapped. He grabbed this hatchet. Why there was a hatchet sitting on a furnace in their basement, I don't know. But he grabbed the hatchet and brutally began attacking his sister, beating her and cutting into her head. Just brutally, violently murdered her in the basement. And then, you know, dropped the hatchet, walked upstairs. It seems like he was definitely having uh, to say he was having a manic episode, I think, is a passive way to describe what was happening. And he went, he went upstairs to the bathroom. He was looking for a razor blade. And he ultimately found one, and he slit his throat with it. And as he was, you know, bleeding out, he dropped the razor and kind of stumbled into the living room of the house, where he then collapsed at that house back on Everett between 21st and 22nd. So, a classic example of what happens when you think someone's ready to go back out in the world again, and it turns out they're not even close. Um, one of the crazy things that ultimately ended up happening was, despite his efforts, uh, Merle Meneer didn't die. He was actually discovered, I think unconscious, by his wife, probably long-suffering wife, when she came home, opened the door, and there he is just bleeding all over the living room. Like, ugh, quite the scene. And so her immediate thought is, where is Maudine? And she couldn't find her because she's down in the basement dead. And so she called her husband, this prominent musician, and he came home and I guess conducted a much more in-depth search and he was the one who tragically ended up discovering his wife brutally, maniacally beaten to death in the basement of their home. So, Merle Meneer somehow survived. They were able to get into a hospital, but Marty Nickerson didn't have a chance. And by the time Merle Meneer came around uh, from his injuries, he he was obviously in a very unstable state, a very manic state, and he claimed that he did what he did essentially because he blamed his sister for everything that either had gone wrong or that he had perceived had gone wrong in his life. He expressed that he blamed his sister Maudine for the downfall of his own wife, which I'm guessing, I mean, doesn't surprise me. I was thinking if he's, you know, in a <laughs> mental asylum, odds are, Probably his wife isn't having a very happy, pleasant existence, having to deal with it and live with that. Um, but whatever the extent of that downfall, Meneer blamed his sister Maudine for that. However, she would might have been responsible, I don't really know. Uh, most likely just the ramblings of a crazy guy. But in specific relation to his own sister, he said that since she had released him you know, had him taken out of the asylum only three days prior. He said that she had been trying to poison him since, since the day that she brought him home, the moment she brought him home, she'd been trying to poison him. So he killed her to preserve his life is essentially what it gets down to. So, you know, in the end here, you can see this is clearly not a guy who was in control of his mental faculties. He was still very mentally ill, very much gone, probably, possibly, to an extent, destabilized by the fact that he'd been in an asylum for so long and now suddenly is released and he's taken to a home, it's a new, a new situation for him, it's new surroundings. It's very possible he wasn't prepared to deal with that and that could have set off 
all sorts of triggers in his mind. Again, I don't know exactly what his mental state was that led him to being institutionalized, but I mean, any assortment of things could have happened to drive him crazy and he seemed to take the path that his sister was trying to kill him. Maybe she was, I doubt it, but <laughs> that, was, that was the story he went with as to why he did what he did. And with that admission as to his motives, there really, really wasn't a whole lot more to do or say on the case. Merle Muneer was sent to the Oregon State Hospital. Um, who knows what the quality of his care was after that. Um, but yeah, it, it was obvious this guy had just been released from an asylum. He had this manic homicidal episode. It was obvious he was in no position to be out on the streets, but it was, I mean, they didn't even need to really have a trial to determine that this guy was, you know, out of his mind. And that was what led him to doing what he did. So the resolution to that crime was Merle Manier was returned to an institutionalized state where he tragically probably shouldn't have been released from at least when he was, if not ever. Um, it's the unfortunate tragedy of that particular situation is the fact that you have family who again just want so badly to believe that the day is going to come where a mentally ill family member is going to be okay to be released and sometimes that happens but sometimes we convince ourselves that people are ready when they're absolutely not and that was what happened and that is why Maudie Nickerson died in such a horrific fashion in her home back on Everett Street. Well, I guess I'm still on Everett Street, so you know, handful of blocks that way here in the Alphabet District. So that's it for this episode. Thank you again so much for watching, especially if you made it to the end. You know, people watching, I ain't no girl. Eh, I've been called worse while I'm vlogging. I don't know if you heard that, but a girl just drove by and said, hey girl, to me. I guess if I let people at work say that to me, I should let the people in the public. This is the public. You're the viewing public. You're the people that support me. Anyway, uh, thanks so much for watching in. Remember, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Wait a minute, is this where? Oh no, yeah. I was about to say, in another episode, I do. I'm like, hey, I filmed a movie in this, this apartment building, and I just realized that the case I did is one block from here so that's why I'm having deja vu about that this is a horrible this is a horrible ending I keep getting distracted by things but um anyway all that stuff I just said patreon <laughs> I promote that patreon I need your money kinda uh, but as always thanks again for watching one more time and this has been Steve the amateur historian with another episode of historic murders of Portland catch you next time <laughs>